Hi, this is History with Andrew Allen, and today is episode 8 of my series, The Formation of the United States of America, Ratification Part 2. Before I forget, I include the names of the people I talk about and my sources in the description. As I explained last episode, the Confederation Congress had agreed to transmit the proposed Constitution to the ratifying conventions held by the individual states. Supporters of ratification were called Federalists, opposed by Anti-Federalists. While some Anti-Federalists were completely opposed to the new Constitution, many opponents feared that they would lose hard-won rights like freedom of religion, free speech, and trial by jury, since they were not part of the Constitution. Even so, the Federalists enjoyed a steady stream of victories as ratification was approved by Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maryland, and South Carolina. The score was 8-0, to zero, and only nine states needed to approve ratification for it to pass. Victory seemed inevitable until Federalists in New Hampshire arranged for the convention to be postponed because they feared they would lose, which might inspire opponents of ratification in other states. Worse news followed. The Rhode Island Assembly had distributed a thousand copies of the Constitution, giving the state's voters time to consider the issue before its assembly met in February. The assembly held a statewide referendum in late March, and apparently the extra time to consider the issue had not changed anyone's mind since ratification was voted down by a massive margin. Rhode Island's opposition to ratification was probably due to several factors. Like other New Englanders, Rhode Islanders feared direct taxes and two- and six-year terms since their lower house was elected twice a year and the governor annually. But the main issue was probably the Constitution's prohibition of state-issued currency, which threatened Rhode Island since it used paper currency to pay off its Revolutionary War debt, which was held by a small group of speculators, thus avoiding widening the wealth gap. Still, Rhode Island was relatively insignificant. However, Virginia was not, and its convention started on June 2nd while New Hampshire would reconvene on June 18th, and victory in New Hampshire was far from certain. Virginia would be critical, so the struggle would pit Patrick Henry, a spellbinding orator, against James Madison, a poor speaker but a much better debater. The two men had clashed repeatedly before, and while Madison had blocked Henry's attempt to levy a tax to benefit Virginia's churches, Henry had usually emerged victorious. Actually, Madison had the advantage, since he had taken copious notes during the convention, had organized his thinking while helping to draft the Federalist Papers, and was determined to convince delegates with arguments that they would remember rather than impress them with oratory. However, Henry would be supported by George Mason, who was equally familiar with the Constitution, since he had argued in person against it for months. Oddly enough, given the vital importance of the convention, several leading Virginians were absent. Thomas Jefferson was still in Paris, and both George Washington and Richard Henry Lee had chosen to remain at home. The dark horse was Governor Edmund Randolph, who had refused to commit to either side. It is worth mentioning that the convention in Richmond was first held it is worth mentioning that the convention in Richmond was the first held in a city that was not a port, which mattered since ports depended on trade, so people who lived in ports were more willing to support the Federalists. It soon became clear that Henry had no familiarity with the world outside of the 13 states and little interest in the other states. He simply wanted Virginia to remain the dominant state, and he remained the dominant politician in Virginia. To be fair, he reflected the belief that the residents of the states were Virginians, not Americans, but Madison represented the belief that Virginians would become Americans. Fortunately, Governor Randolph had been lured to the Federalist side. Apparently, he had changed his mind in the time since the convention had ended, since he had refused to sign the Constitution. Responding to Henry's arguments that the United States could not survive without Virginia, Randolph commented that Virginia could not survive alone. It needed a navy to defend its coast and militia from other states to help keep the huge slave population under control and to defend the frontier. In the end, Virginia voted 
89 in favor of ratification and 79 against. Three of the votes in favor came from the Kentucky delegation who were concerned about navigation rights on the Mississippi, and a stronger federal government would be more likely to secure a favorable treaty with Spain. This victory cemented ratification since the score was now 10 states to zero. Wait, 10 states? Oh, right. New Hampshire's convention had reconvened on June 18th and voted on June 21st after several days of intense debate. A last-minute decision by the Federalists to recommend amendments, essentially the same amendments proposed by the Massachusetts convention, ensured that ratification passed 57 to 47. So the remaining conventions must have been a formality? Not exactly. Although the Federalist Papers were written to convince the New York Convention to ratify the Constitution, they failed. When the ballots were finally counted in late May, the Anti-Federalists led by Governor Clinton had won 46 seats against 19 for the Federalists. Unlike elections for the Assembly, which required property ownership, any adult male could vote. So the numbers were not favorable for ratification, but the number of states that had already ratified was favorable. John Jay had contributed five essays to the Federalist Papers and then stopped when he became ill. The enforced break appears to have convinced him to produce a shorter, more easily understood defense of ratification, one that was specifically targeted at New York. The 17-page pamphlet was published two weeks before the elections, so it would be fresh in people's minds. An opposing pamphlet of 26 pages was published two days later, probably authored by Melanchthon Smith, which argued that since both sides agreed that amendments were necessary, it made sense to settle the amendments before ratification, not after. The ratifying convention met in Poughkeepsie, a small town halfway between New York and Albany. Unlike other conventions, both sides accepted that the delegates would discuss the Constitution as a committee of the whole. Since the Anti-Federalists wanted to actually debate each clause, while the Federalists wanted to delay in the hope that good news would arrive from Virginia, since they realized that they would likely lose the vote otherwise. Hamilton was a key Federalist speaker and made lengthy speeches, but that was his style and probably not on purpose to run out the clock. Melanchthon Smith was a key speaker for the Anti-Federalists and wanted a larger House of Representatives because he wanted the legislature to reflect the huge number of ordinary middle-class Americans. Although he had married into the aristocracy, Hamilton denied its existence and responded that smaller districts were easier to corrupt. A week after the convention started, news arrived that New Hampshire had ratified the Constitution, thus validating the Federalist plan. Except, the Anti-Federalists did not appear to care. So, the debate moved on to the federal government's ability to tax, since the Anti-Federalists wanted taxation power to rest largely with the states. Essentially, the Anti-Federalists believed that the state governments understood the economic situation of their respective states better than a distant federal government, and the Federalists disagreed. Even when news arrived on July 2nd of Virginia's ratification, the Anti-Federalists appeared unmoved and the debates continued. Still, by the end of the convention, Melanchthon Smith and several other Anti-Federalists had already acknowledged the futility of opposing ratification. Tired of waiting for the convention to ratify, New York City held a huge parade on July 23rd to celebrate the enactment of the Constitution. Three days later, ratification passed 30 to 27, although the state's version included 32 recommended amendments as well as a demand for a Bill of Rights. The ratification was a Federalist victory, but the Anti-Federalists made mistakes. In particular, the New York Convention should have been held sooner. Eight states had already ratified the Constitution by the time the New York Convention was held, which made ratification seem unstoppable. While it seemed that the ratification debate was over, there was still North Carolina since its convention assembled on July 21st, nearly four months after the delegates had been elected. This delay was intended to allow people to travel across a huge region that stretched 500 miles from the Atlantic to the Appalachians and then another 400 miles into the interior. 
The state had the fourth largest population of 430,000 people, but they were spread out in small towns and remote villages. Even though 11 states had already voted to ratify the Constitution, Federalists faced a challenge in North Carolina because the state lacked a good port, so did a smaller proportion of people connected to commerce, and its poor soil meant that it had few large plantations. Instead, it had many struggling farmers who had little interest in surrendering political power to a distant government controlled by rich city people. The Anti-Federalists criticized the lack of a Bill of Rights, the aristocratic nature of the Senate, and the massive power of Congress to levy taxes. The majority of the delegates refused to ratify without amendments, so it was no surprise that the convention voted 184 to 83 against ratification until there was a Bill of Rights. While the wealthy merchants and plantation owners feared the consequences of North Carolina remaining outside the new nation, the average farmer living in an isolated village probably did not care. Actually, the movement for amendments was growing since Cumberland County in Pennsylvania organized a meeting on September 3rd to debate proposed amendments, attracting delegates from 13 counties in the city of Philadelphia, including Robert Whitehill, John Smiley, and Albert Gallatin. The meeting proposed 12 amendments but did not advocate for a separate Bill of Rights. The idea of amendments proved popular in New York and Virginia as well. Even so, Madison was not very worried since the wide variety of amendments would make it difficult for supporters to agree, especially since Rhode Island had refused to join and North Carolina would not join without amendments. So it would be unlikely that two-thirds of states would ask for another convention. The Federalists opposed a second convention because they knew that delegates to such a convention would have clear instructions from their respective states. Basically, they would have to consult the people they claim to represent, so it would be very hard to produce a nationalist constitution. The Nationalists won because they were better organized, had the reputation of Washington behind them, and framed it as a yes or no choice. Even so, it was close and might not have passed if the states had voted in a different order. I will just quickly review what happened during the Confederation period, because it was an eventful five years. The American states had won their independence from Britain, but freedom came at a cost. Aside from British economic warfare, both the Confederation Congress and the state governments imposed heavy taxes to pay off the huge debts from the war. The crushing taxes drove many farmers into bankruptcy. At the same time, influential land speculators lobbied to expand the borders of their states into frontier land, but those regions pushed to become states rather than endure rule by far-off state capitals. The key issue was whether individual states would expand or the number of states would expand. Finally, the British still had forts on the American side of the border with Canada, as if they were waiting for the barely united states to break up so they could invade. When Secretary of Foreign Affairs John Jay failed to negotiate a treaty with Spain that would open New Orleans to farmers and planters in the western region, many American political leaders concluded that the Articles of Confederation were fatally flawed and a more powerful federal government was required. James Madison used a convention at Annapolis, Maryland, to resolve protectionist trade barriers as an excuse to call for a larger convention to be held in Philadelphia next year. There was no guarantee that it would be more productive, except farmers in the backcountry of Massachusetts revolted in December 1786 after a wealthy speculator became governor and drastically increased taxes in order to pay off the state debt which would benefit a small number of speculators, since most members of the state militia either refused to serve or joined the rebels, the speculators financed a private army. The failure of the militia to defeat the revolt made members of legislatures in other states reconsider the value of a stronger national government. When the Constitutional Convention at Philadelphia officially started, Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph proposed the Virginia Plan, a radical plan, since representation in the new Congress would be decided by population, not allocated equally to states, thus ending the sovereignty of the states. Delegates would now have to decide whether to keep the existing government or make something new. 
Once the majority of the delegations voted to accept a supreme national government rather than a federation of states, the rest of the convention consisted of debates over the exact nature of the new government. Months of lengthy speeches and grudging compromises produced a framework of government with a president and a lower house with directly elected representatives and an upper house where each state had two members. A key compromise was the decision of the northern states to accept that slaves would be considered equal to three-fifths of a free person when calculating the population of a state to allocate congressional seats, accepting slavery in exchange for a stronger national government. Despite the clear need for a Bill of Rights, none of the delegates had the necessary energy for more debate, so it was simply ignored. The entire convention had lasted for four months and a sizable number of delegates had failed to make it to the end, but the remaining delegates had finally hammered out a constitution that would create a new nation, the United States of America. Well, if the constitution was ratified by a minimum of nine states. Over a period of eight months, each state held a ratification convention and the Federalists won eight conventions in a row, although the margin of victory was often close. When Virginia became the ninth state to ratify the Constitution, the United States of America was born. In the end, only 11 states ratified, Rhode Island and North Carolina voted to remain outside the Union. The need to convince them to join and to draft a Bill of Rights would be only two of the many challenges facing the new nation. But they will have to wait for another series. Thanks for listening.